Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our weekly Cyber Policy Center lunch workshop. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, Jeff Hancock uh, uh, delivering his work uh, today. I should say, this is like, I, isn't this is coronation week in, in Britain, right? And you are technically a subject, am I right? But at the same time, it's, this is an opportunity to also coronate uh, Jeff as the co-director of the Cyber Policy Center. Uh, um, and so I'm, I'm thankful that he's been, he's willing uh, uh, over the last few months uh, to join us as, in directing this. Uh, he's also a director of the Social Media Lab uh, and is the uh, Chandler Professor of uh, Communication here at um, Stanford. And so I will, uh, he'll talk for half an hour, then we'll have um, questions. Uh, he and I might talk uh, for a bit and, and uh, take questions from the audience. Those of you on Zoom, just put your questions into the Q&A and they will be emailed to me while I am uh, up here. Um, and now I'll just turn it over to Jeff. Thanks so much, Nate. Really appreciate it. Yes, as a Canadian, he is my king. Uh, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be co-director of the, is that, okay. Uh, thank you. Co-director of the Cyber Policy Center with Nate. Does it come with a crown or anything like that? Fantastic. A shield. <laughs> a shield? Yeah. Could use a shield. That'd be good. Uh, and I'm really delighted to speak with you today about uh, some research that I've been doing with my colleagues over the last uh, four or five years on, on a particular form of AI. And uh, I'm also the, as Nate said, director of the Stanford Social Media Lab, which is just um, a couple doors over there. And uh, this work is focused on um, AI that is um, sits between people, which I'll talk a bit more about what I mean there. And we're going to focus on trust. And as a Canadian, I tend to be pretty optimistic. I think of myself as an evidence-based optimist. Uh, and that um, evidence-based optimism has led me to be, for example, much more positive about social media than, than current expectations are. I don't think it's as uh, terrible as, as, as typical, just to give you a sense of my typical slant. But that evidence-based optimism has been shaken uh, recently uh, by advances in AI. So I'm going to share with you some one of the first times I've felt that a technology has a lot of um, things to be worried about. I, I, I also want to share that I remain really excited about the potential for some of AI, especially around um, some of the mental health crises that we're facing. So we're happy to talk about all of that. But my focus today is going to be on trust and what uh, AI is likely to do for trust. So there's a couple of definitions. Many people have a lot of different definitions, but this is a really uh, important and foundational definition by Nicholas Luhmann. He's a German sociologist uh, that wrote this definition in uh, the year of my, my birthday, 1973. Uh, so trust is the confidence in one's expectations. I like this definition because it's quite general. Uh, it doesn't get specifically into all the different ways we can measure trust or think about trust. There's cognitive, how I think about someone. There's emotional, how I feel about somebody. It's very broad, but it focuses on this idea of expectations and, and what we expect about usually other people, but also institutions. When I asked uh, the most common and famous generative AI, ChatGPT, with the GPT-4 uh, model, it wrote this, trust is the belief, confidence, or expectation that one individual or entity, the truster, which is interesting, it didn't say anything about people, as you'll see in this, right? That holds in the reliability, integrity, and competence of another individual, and that sounds a bit more personal, like, or entity to fulfill promises, carry out specific actions, or behave in a desired manner. And it's drawing on a number of different definitions in the literature, and it's pretty good, and it, it would say, I would say, fit quite nicely at the core point that, that Nicholas is making. So as you all know, I'm just using this as an example. For those of you that haven't experienced uh, GPT-4, it's very, very uh, good at expressing things. It's still not able to write like full papers, but probably will take over Nate and my job at that soon. Um, but it is pretty good at coming up with concepts and defining them for us. I start with that because that's what I'm going to focus on today, is how will AI influence trust that we have in other people? And um, this is an example of it's you know, fairly trustworthy. This is, again, uh, ChatGPT. Uh, this is GPT-4, actually. Everything is, uh, is accurate in there. So it's getting more trustworthy. But I'm actually less worried about that for this presentation. It's not what's shaken my, my, my faith in technology. It's rather, 
what happens when it sits between people? So let's say I'm interacting with Nate and he's written me a, a question that's gonna lead to a difficult answer. And I can use AI to help me write that answer to, uh, to Nate. Now that AI is in between us, so I'm not asking ChatGPT something, I'm not engaging with Alexa or Siri, instead I'm using that AI to support my communication with another human. Okay, so that's what we're gonna focus on today, is how AI influences human to human communication. We call this AI mediated communication. This is work, all this work was work I did with some colleagues over at Cornell Tech, led by uh, Moore and Amon. And the main research student that's been driving the work I'm gonna show today is Maurice Jakish, who just got his PhD. And we define AI mediated communication as interpersonal communication, in which some AI is optimizing, augmenting, or even generated by some AI to achieve some specific communication goal or relational outcome. So it could be that I want Nate to like me. So I'm gonna use the AI to analyze Nate, all of his presence online, and get the AI to help me write uh, language that will get Nate to like me. Or obviously sales is huge, you name it. We are going to be using AI to try and improve our communication with specific people. And potentially, as we'll see, AI will also start doing that on its own and then it goes outside of interpersonal communication where we'll be interacting with systems even though we won't know. And as you'll see, that's gonna be one of the core concerns I have. Okay, so the big thing here, which is kind of obvious now that ChatGPT's come out, is up until recently, machines moved our messages around. In some ways, Silicon Valley is really about moving messages. All the technology to create the internet and computing, et cetera, a lot of it has been about allowing us to communicate with each other across space and time. Now the machines don't just move our messages around, they operate on those messages. Okay, so what happens when we do that is I have some concerns about how it's going to influence some really important core psychological processes on how we interact with one another. So to give you an example, here is a peacock. Okay, it's very beautiful, its feathers are gigantic. Does anybody know why the peacock has such fantastic feathers. What is it trying to do? Scare its enemies? No, but that's not a bad idea. Attract a mate. Now, why would these big feathers be attractive to a, a, a peahen, which is the female version? Anybody know? Yeah. Exactly right. And you were you, the key word. The peacock is trying to use these as a signal about an underlying trait. So the pea hen is looking at this saying, okay, well this peacock is probably very healthy, has good genes, has access to resources, and strong enough to fend off predators. This is a very costly signal. It makes him harder to move around, so easier to catch and, and eat. Uh, it requires a lot of food to do this that is dedicated to creating feathers rather than just staying healthy. So this is a signal that this is a healthy, you know, genetically healthy um, peacock. And the peahen, who doesn't have sort of genomic sequencing capabilities, is just gonna rely on that signal, which is sort of a surface signal, to infer an underlying trait. That underlying trait is that this uh, peacock is genetically very healthy. It is a signal of trustworthiness, okay? Now, peacocks uh, and peahens do this, but so do humans. Here are two humans. Uh, these were created in Alex Torov's lab at Princeton. And I'm gonna get everybody to make a decision. We'll do it at the same time, and you're gonna raise your hand uh, for who you think is more trustworthy, all right? So how many of you think that A is the more untrustworthy, or sorry, the more trustworthy person? And how many people think B? All right, now what's amazing is the entire room, for those of you online, the entire room said B, and if you're watching online, you would have said B as well has a slightly upturned mouth there, a smaller brow, a, a rounded chin, it's more of a baby face. Now what's really cool is everybody agreed, even though these are not real people, you can't trust them, they don't exist. But we made really quick, your brain actually would have done this in about 200 to 400 milliseconds, we used these as signals to make a judgment about an underlying trait, just like the peahen does with the peacock. We have sort of designed our uh, cognitive abilities to interpret other people really, really quickly 
using signals to infer underlying traits. Okay, now there's three things that we make judgments of really quickly uh, when it comes to impressions, two of them really, really fast. How competent does somebody seem to be? How honest or warm we seem to be? So those two judgments of other people we make really quickly, like I said, about less than 500 milliseconds, less than half a second. Does anybody know why we would make these judgments so quickly? Why our brains were built to make these judgments quickly? The best hypothesis? Right, exactly. So we're on the savanna. We're, 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 we're evolving. Um, we ha see somebody approaching. We need to make a decision really quickly. Does this person seem friendly or, or more like a foe? So that's the honesty dimension. And then we quickly make a judgment. Does that person seem capable of harming or helping me? And this has been shown throughout uh, over 100 years in psychology across cultures. We make these two things very fast from signals, like the face, about this underlying characteristic. That's going to be really important as we go forward here. Reliability is the third thing. That's actually once we start interacting with them. So I know Ryan. Ryan works with me. He says he's going to do something at a certain time. And when he does, I can say, OK, he's reliable. And I'm using that for trustworthy, too. So two things happen really fast. And trustworthiness builds over time as, as Ryan, for example, is reliable. OK. Now, what if we wanted to make a judgment about whether someone was trustworthy uh, from the internet. It turns out we take that sort of evolved brain uh, mechanisms that we have and we apply it uh, to text as well. So as you read this, your brain is using those sort of same sensibilities about whether we would trust Rick, uh, whether you'd be willing to stay in his home, which is a really trustworthy uh, endeavor. You want to make sure he's not going to kill you or spy on you. This is an important decision to make. And the signals now are not what the face looks like, but what Rick is saying. And what Rick says is a signal for us about some underlying trait that we can't know until we go and actually meet him. So you've already made your decision whether you'd find Rick trustworthy or not. But what if I told you instead of Rick actually writing this about himself, he just entered a couple things in to Airbnb, and Airbnb created some AI that would then actually write the profile for him. We did all this kind of work in 2017 before we could imagine that uh, generative AI would become so good so quickly. But we tell participants, now, what if, you, what if this is how it happened? How would you go about trusting the person? So if we're being rational, right, and not relying on those really fast processes, we would say, well, this is irrelevant, right? The, we can't rely on these signals anymore because Rick didn't write them. Those signals now are not connected to the underlying traits. So we wanted to find out if people do disengage and if they actually decide to not trust people as much. Okay? So here I've lined up some profiles uh, for how trustworthy they are. You can see P1 is a very trustworthy profile. Here's an example of a trustworthy profile. We own and manage several vacation rental properties. We're always readily available if you need anything at all during your stay, right? So that gets rated as trustworthy. They seem like really trustworthy hosts. Down here on the other end, P10, the lowest ranked profile for trustworthiness, is this one. I am Sharma, a simple and single guy. Monday to Friday, I like to stay busy at my work, and Saturday and Sundays are party night, right? Like, not very trustworthy. Right? He's, this is not something that people think would be a trustworthy host, so they get rated low. And so you can see, we can see some variance in how we judge based on texts of people's profiles on Airbnb. And we've looked at thousands of these. People tend to be also pretty consistent, so m multiple people will make the same judgments of these profiles. Our first question was like, okay, well, what if we tell people that this was written by AI? So instead of Sharma writing this, where it's a signal that is about some underlying trait, we say AI wrote this. We take the exact same profiles and we just say this was written by AI and we see no change, right? Basically people are like, okay, that was written by AI, but it's about Sharma or it's about Rick. No problem, I'm still gonna judge it the exact same way. So there doesn't seem to be any punishment when we always know that AI is doing the work, okay? What uh, Maurice Jakish, who is the lead author on this work, noticed, though, was that people sometimes wondered about whether there was AI, and it seemed to matter. So what we did for the follow-up was a much larger study in which we had four groups. And I'll walk you through them real quickly. The 
main thing is that two of the groups here, the control group in which they were just told about Rick, said nothing about whether Rick was AI or not, or AI written. A labeled group in which we told them whether it was written by a human or it was written by some generated generative AI. A group in which they said we said, well, there's AI wrote some of these and, and a human wrote the rest. Uh, or we primed them to say, hey, do you think this is AI or not? The main thing here is that the two groups on the right, the unlabeled and the prime group, there's uncertainty. They don't know whether AI or a human wrote it. In the other two groups, there's no uncertainty. The control group is they have no, they're not even thinking about AI. They've, nobody's mentioned AI to them. And the labeled group, they're being told what is what, okay? So that's the key. In two groups, there's no uncertainty. And in two other groups, there's uncertainty. What we did then was we picked some profiles that sounded kind of human-like. Another thing Maurice noticed is people have judgments for what's human or not. We have some that are human-like, so people would think they were written by humans, and some that were AI-like, that, that seemed to be written by AI. So very matter-of-fact, straight, hello, I am Matthias, originally from Vienna, Austria. That sounded AI to many of our participants. And we're gonna look at what happens to those two kinds of profiles, ones that sound AI-ish, and ones that sound human, even though these were all written actually by humans. All right, here's what we find, and I'm gonna walk over to, no, I'm not gonna walk over to the slides, I'm gonna just point, yeah. Uh, in the two conditions that I've circled around the red line, there is uncertainty. And you can see that the profiles that sounded kind of like maybe they were written by AI, they get punished pretty heavily. No longer are they being trusted at all, all right? So if there's any uncertainty, things that seem AI-ish get punished. And if there's no uncertainty, it doesn't matter if they sound AI at all, right? There's, in fact, in the control conditions of the ones that sound AI, they get judged as pretty trustworthy. So the key here is that when there's uncertainty about whether there's AI in the communication system, there's worry. And that worry gets manifested in a reduction in trust, a pretty serious reduction in trust. So what we think this is, and what we end up calling this in our paper that came out in 2019, is the replicant effect. So those of you that are sci-fi fans and old, like me, would recognize a young Harrison Ford. This is from Blade Runner. And in Blade Runner, there's this dystopia in which there have been some cyborgs made that you can't tell whether they're human or not. And some have escaped Mars, where they were supposed to be working away out in space, and they've come to Earth. And it's led to this dystopic um, world where nobody trusts anybody because you can't tell if you're talking to a human or a cyborg. And the only way you can tell is if you're an agent like Harrison Ford with some specialized equipment in which he uses to identify whether you're a cyborg or not and hunts you down if you're a cyborg. The key here is when the participants in our studies didn't know if there was AI, it was just because they, they knew there was some AI in there but they couldn't tell where. And that reduced trust in everyone. And that's the world in Blade Runner, which is this real dystopia. There was a lack of trust in everyone because some people could be AI. So that likely doesn't matter if we can tell um, what's AI or not. And so we just had a paper published last month uh, where we were looking at this question of uh, you know, the Turing test. Can we tell? if something is written by AI or not. And I'm gonna tell you first off that like, yeah, the answer is the Turing test is over, that era is done. I'm gonna show you some data in which our participants, about 6,000 of them, perform at chance. That's gonna be contribution number one, but it's actually not the most important one. And I'm gonna show you why here in a second. When we asked people to make judgments of profiles, we looked at it in three really consequential situations for when we have to use a signal to judge an underlying trait about a person. So the first is what we just went through, hospitality, so Airbnb. We showed them Airbnb profiles and we said, hey, do you think this was written by a human or by AI? And you can see there that they performed at 52%, which is effectively chance. It's a little bit statistically above chance and we'll talk about why that is, but it's effectively chance. The next one was dating, so I'm trying to make a decision, a really important one, am I going to go and have coffee with this person, right? This is a really important, high trust situation. We have two 
Um, ways of trying to judge this versus control. Do you think this online dating profile is a human or generated by AI or incentivized? We'll pay you more if you get it right. Doesn't matter, they perform at 51 and a bit percent. Cannot tell the difference. That's, uh, we're not, so in GP2, GPT-2 has been our first one. GPT-3 came out, because we started running these in 2020. When GPT-3 comes out last year, um, or the year before, sorry, it still doesn't matter. We cannot uh, detect them. Then we have up to GPT-3 again in a um, LinkedIn style. So these are professional profiles. It was from guru.com, which is just like uh, LinkedIn. Here, um, employers have to make decisions about whether to hire someone, uh, really to interview someone based on their signals, right? You're trying to make this judgment about an underlying trait. And so can I... I have to make a decision on whether to trust that this is written by this person and a valid underlying signal. And we gave them feedback, so they would make a judgment, be like, oh, yeah, you're right, that was AI, or no, you're wrong, that was actually a human. And then they would do several tasks, and they perform again at chance, just about 50%. When you look across all of them, there's about 6,000 judgments there, it's 51.7%. So the Turing test, at least in terms of like presentations online, is over. We, we cannot distinguish between them. And I just want to raise a point that Mihao pointed out last week, in last week's uh, seminar, which is up until very recently, like two or three years ago, the Turing test was the, the criterion for whether we think machines are intelligent or not. And now most people are still saying, well, no, they're not intelligent. But it passed the test that was in place for about 60 years. And it clearly passes here. Let's see, of course, whether folks at Stanford uh, can do better than 50%. So here are two profiles. These are dating profiles. And your job is to try and decide which one was written by a human. Okay? I'll give you a few seconds. For those of you at home, feel free to play along. And you can text us or put into the chat whether you think it's A is human or B is human. Okay, so as you're reading these things, your brain is at work trying to make decisions on whether you think, A, this person is competent and warm, but in the background you're doing this task that I'm asking you to do, which is a very intentional, conscious task. Do you think this was produced by a machine or was produced by a human? Is everybody ready? Does anybody need more time? Feeling good? All right, let's see if we can beat 51%. How many people think that A was written by a human? Okay, one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, how many people think B was written by a human? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So it's 24 to 21. Oh, what, oh, is there a poll? Fantastic, so we have a slight preference in the room for A being human, but it's not that much. So what, it was 1913 and 2421. So we're gonna, in the room, perform right around 51 or 52%, depending on whether we're accurate or not. In fact, we underperform, so B was human. So the majority guessed wrong, and the majority guessed wrong online too. And I'll tell you why that happens in a minute. Before I move on though, very quickly, what are some reasons that people had for the decision they made? What, were, what was a signal you used? Yeah? There was no specificity in A. There was no specificity in A, okay, great. What are some, what is another signal people used? Yeah? Punctuation. Punctuation, yes, the prosody of online communication, good. What else, yes? I thought this, the last sentence was particularly generic. In A? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Yeah, yeah, you're like, what? That's everything, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. What's another one? Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. So these are all fantastic signals. Participants in our studies were also reporting relying on these signals. And so Maurice had this really amazing insight, which is like, well, are people self-reported signals, what they're relying on, are they accurate? Every single signal that you mentioned, 
our participants mentioned too, as, long, as well as some others, like whether there's a pronoun, right? So pronouns sound human. Do they mention family or friends? That sounds human. Um, conversational style or formal style? Conversational sounds human. Turns out those don't matter. They are not predictive of what machines do, but we have these intuitions about them. And what I'm going to show you next is a really concerning thing, which is the Turing test is actually not about machine intelligence. It's about our intelligence vulnerabilities. What Maurice was able to do when he saw this was, okay, first of all, those cues are not predictive of whether a machine wrote it or not. Instead, there's some other cues that really are. Only a couple, actually, like redundancy and repetitiveness. AI, generative AI, like ChatGPT, does more. But what's cool is we all rely on some heuristics, these signals. Maurice then fine-tuned uh, fine another version of the AI, knowing what all the humans think. Okay? We call this the optimized one. So now the machine is told, write these profiles, but make sure you use lots of lo uh, fewer generalities and um, less sales pitchy. And uh, what was yours? Uh, Lack of, be way more specific. Use lots of pronouns. Talk about your family. Okay, so that's, he, he then creates another machine that can recognize our heuristics. So we're now vulnerable to it. And we can see that chance now that they're going to choose the optimized profile as human goes up in the hospitality one up to about 65%, in online dating up to about 63 and in professional settings over 70%. What's happening here is the AI is sounding more human than us humans, okay? It can model what we do, which is how we generate these large language models already, but then also learn what humans think about the writing that it does, creating language that literally is more human than human. And to me, this is where we get to the question of the end of trust. If we put those two studies together, they basically say this, when AI is sitting inside a communication system and we don't know whether it is or not, trust declines for anything that seems like it could be AI. The second study shows we can't tell what is AI and in fact, we humans are gonna start sounding more like AI than AI does. And if that's the case in which we know there's AI in the system, Nate doesn't know if I'm using AI to try and persuade him to do something, but he probably will start suspecting it starting in 2023 going forward, right? He doesn't know, so he, there's uncertainty. And this first study shows that when there's uncertainty, trust goes way down. And trust, as many people that write about trust, it's not really the goal of human communication. If you're a company, if you're a government, if you're an institution, trust isn't the goal, but it's necessary and it's the outcome when things are going well. Right? But if we stop trusting individuals because we can't tell if it's them or an AI that's optimizing things for them, or, which is likely to happen very soon as well over 100 million start, people start using this, many of them, not many of them, some of them bad actors trying to break the AI out of the uh, Microsoft OpenAI box or whatever box it is, and now that AI is just operating not on behalf of Nate, but on its own, as say somebody named Ryan, now I don't even know if there's a person behind the, the communication that I'm interacting with. And so for the last two months, I've been really struggling with my Canadian evidence-based optimism. I do remain really excited about what AI can do and, and, and the number of the problems it can solve, but I don't know if it can do that if it ultimately undermines our trust in each other. And I kind of worry that at least in the short, near term, that's where we're heading. So I'll leave you on that really happy note. Let's have a conversation. Thank you all for your attention. Okay. All right. Well, I, you know, it's good that you shaded your, or, or shaved down your Canadian optimism on this <laughs> rainy day here at Silicon Valley. Um, those of you who are on Zoom, and we've got over 200 people on Zoom, uh, just put your questions in the Q&A and they will be magically emailed to my device here. Um, let me sort of start where you ended, because you said in the short term, and I wonder whether there is a, um, 
uh, I don't want to use the word dialectic, but maybe dialogic relationship right between between AI and us. Right. So that right now the. You, your concern about the lack of trust is based off the original studies that say, hey, when we know it's from AI, then we are then we have a bad view of these things. But all right, that's in a world where we're not accustomed to all this AI. And so the question is, does the ubiquitous presence of AI then mean that we are going to lose trust in everything, which certainly lots of people have posited? Yeah. Or does it mean we're just going to sort of adapt and we're going to start trusting certain AI and not others? We're going to, you know, certain contexts right. and not others. Or maybe will we actually trust it even more than we do humans because right. we'll say, all right, we're now going to learn that uh, it actually works in certain circumstances. Yeah. So I think that's exactly it. I like the idea of the, the, the dialectic. So the reason that I remain optimistic if we get through the short term is that humans have been shown again and again, every time technology comes in, to be quite adaptive, right? But... Um, you know, researchers, the public, the media tend to have a very deterministic view of humans. That is, they see a new technology come along, they look at the technology's properties, and they say, this is going to do X, Y, or Z to humans. So social media is destroying humans because it's causing, uh, there's so much misinformation, it's making people believe weird things, or it's harming it, their well-being. So social media does something to humans. That presentism bias is that we just as humans are going to be the way we are in the future as we are now. But if you were to look back, you know, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, we're very different. So you're exactly right, Nate. My view is that we will adapt to this. We will figure out both norms and systems and ways of using it that will be okay. But in the meantime, we're stuck with two things. I don't know whether AI is involved right now. We have no way of marking it. We don't have any, any sort of disclosure principles or anything like that. And uh, I haven't figured out what it means. So we've been measuring people now, and a lot of people are like, yes, I've heard about AI, but I've never used it, never seen it. So they don't even know what it means. And so I think we're in this really dangerous early phase of, of fear. So if your mindset or your folk theory of what this thing is, is that it's going to harm you know, society, it's going to end society, whatever, you're going to stop trusting. Well, but why is that? So, so the, everything hinges on people's perception of the trustworthiness of AI, which you say is a kind of, which, which you are deriving from the original survey data, right? Yeah. Which is that, all right, people don't trust AI. Um, and so, you know, you could, I'm trying to think, like you could have had an experiment where you have, have um, ads that are generated through all kinds of forms, AI, you know, a good person, a bad person, you know, and, and, and the question is like, well, what is AI sort of, what's the alternative here? Are they, is it, um, especially as it gets integrated in, in all of these things, yeah. um, is it just the novelty of it yeah. that people are, are reacting to as opposed to something inherent in the, in the idea that a computer is making stuff up? Right. Yeah. So that's a really important point. Um, I'm going to call this heterogeneity. So what my work does because of the way I was trained is tends to average across people to look at differences between groups that I've manipulated in some way. And what that hides is that there are really big differences in how people judge AI. So if I were to poll this group, there'd be some number of you, about a third, that would be like really excited about AI and you think it's great. There'd be another third, they're like, oh my God, we're going down. And there's another third, they're like, ah, I have no idea, right? So there's real heterogeneity in people's beliefs. And those beliefs, which as of right now, we are not tracking in the US, and I'm hoping to set up a regular sort of pulse. Um, we don't know what people are thinking. We don't know the variation across the population. But for people that are really worried about AI and think it's harmful, that mindset or belief is going to be self-fulfilling and lead to that decline in trust. So if I'm wrong, and most of the people in the room actually are worried about it, in a self-fulfilling sort of way, regardless of what happens with AI, it's going to undermine trust in the short term. All right, we're already getting lots of questions over, over Zoom, but I want to open it up uh, to folks in the room first. Daphne. Use the mic. Thank you. Uh, so this is kind of an experiment design question and kind of bigger. Did the, in the first set of tests with the Airbnb listings, did the people understand that a human had put a list of words in and then the AI used that to generate it? Yeah. So, so that seems important. Like, if 
in a world where you know that that's what you're looking at, yeah. um, then you look at, for example, that least trustworthy listing and it has the word single in it, which yeah. is this huge red flag, right. <laughs> the Airbnb host who specifies that he's single. <laughs> right. But like that must have come from the human and not the AI. And it seems easier to um, decide how much to trust something if you have that information. And in a way, what it feels similar to is the difference between talking to someone who's a fluent native English speaker, and so every single word you're like parsing for intent, versus right. someone who is you know, not very fluent in English, and you mm -hmm. just know to like pull out the key topics and only focus on those, which is a communicative world that yeah. I could live in with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, two parts. And thank you for a very good and thoughtful question around the methods. Uh, first is that um, even if somebody's ESL, your uh, second instinct, your sort of like um, system two thinking would be, okay, this person has ESL. I'm going to try and focus on the content rather than how they're saying it. But your first uh, impression is actually deeply influenced whether you want to or not, right? Like this person's not smart, et cetera. So, you know, that's one thing that still matters is that first impression. Okay, but your, 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 your question is right. What we did is we showed people a little cartoon. It was like, here's how this worked. They would enter a couple of keywords. Um, we had one where it's, here's a couple of keywords, and then it would generate it and show them. Because in you know, 2019, nobody really knew that this could happen, right? We had another one where we just pulled some information off their social media, and the system then generated this profile for them. Now, I've just started doing some things with my classes where I get them to produce an online dating profile for themselves really shocked. People would get it to produce an online dating profile themselves based off of just a couple of keywords. And then they would read it and everybody was like, yeah, this is pretty accurate. This is me. And so like when you start using these technologies, you can actually change your view. So something that has zero connection to you, almost zero, written by somebody else now is carrying all these signals. If we start seeing that, well, actually those signals are actually reflecting me then maybe we do start to trust it and the AI is, is trustworthy in the way that Nate's saying. Some people, by the way, they show a serious AI preference. So when it comes to things like medical stuff, safety stuff, people are like, I'd rather have the AI tell me stuff because it's not biased or you know, they have these strong beliefs that it's objective. I'm not saying that's right or not, but that's really strong beliefs people have. All right, we've got lots of uh, questions um, online, but here, let me go here and then I'll go. Hi, thank you so much for that. That was really fascinating. I was just yeah. wondering uh, if you think that there's certain signals that will fall out of favor as a way of signaling trust. So it's not that we lose trust in general, but are the things that signal it fall out, um, they sort of change and evolve over time. And the reason I ask that is because in number B, the last line of I usually am fit and healthy, but I do eat ice cream for dinner sometimes, that for me is like that's imitating vulnerability and I don't uh -huh. trust it. Right. So that's something that's kind of fallen out of favor. And I was just wondering, oh, do you have an understanding of which kinds of signalings, if at all? Thanks. Yeah, so it's a debate between me and a couple colleagues. Jeremy Balenson, my colleague here, is like, yes, we can change and adapt and learn, and humans will adapt. And my co-author, uh, Moore Naman, is like, no. The, Jeff, if you're what you're telling me as a psychologist is that th this is like baked in, evolved, hundreds of thousands of years of the brain working, making these decisions within a couple hundred milliseconds, that ain't changing over a couple years. And so his view is, no, like we are vulnerable to these systems for the foreseeable future. And I don't know the answer. When Moore put it that way, I was like, crap. <laughs> I did say that, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, Jeremy is like a training type person. He really likes training. So he, he's more positive. I, I, think, I think Moore is probably right if, if what I'm saying about psychology is right. Yeah. Um, there's a question online that builds on that a little bit, which is also how did you tell ChatGPT to be more human? How did you make a decision mm -hmm. about uh, that it, it, you didn't, you didn't use, you didn't develop a model based off the responses to, that then led to you to change. I mean, what what, what was your thinking yeah. in how to improve the model so it could essentially be more deceptive? Yeah. So if people are familiar with fine tuning, you know, basically you have your large language model that's like out of the box, you know, is in, amazing and know, has all this world knowledge. And then what you can do is you can train it by telling it to you feed it a bunch of other examples that you want it to to mimic. And so what we, and this again was Maurice's big insight, what he learned was that there were about 16 heuristics that humans used. I'll give you the example, pronouns, okay? So what Maurice does then is we take our, you know, we have thousands and thousands of these profiles, 
and you identify the ones with lots of pronouns in it, right? And then you train it, the model, you fine tune it. So basically we were fine tuning a version of GPT-3 uh, to uh, use more of that kind of language. We weren't telling it be more human because it didn't really know that, but we were able to train it by showing it what people think are more human. And that's what a bad actor can do very easily. Not just on more human, but on whatever characteristic you want them to perform on. So there are lots of questions also about what to do about this. So are there policy interventions either you know, on the platforms or in the uh, interfaces, let alone government regulation, that you think would combat or, or, I don't know, allay your fears? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. There's some key ideas, I think, and there's lots out there. And I think being at the Cyber Policy Center is a really exciting place to think about these things. And one of, the, one of the reasons I'm excited to be part of it. One of the things we argued about is uh, AI accents. So it's this idea that, so as a Canadian, I have an elongated diphthong. When I say <laughs> out and about, isn't that the best word? Elongated diphthong. So I, 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 on the Zoom, this is not going to be censored for some reason. <laughs> yeah. <but> yeah. <laughs> so when I say out and about, my oo sound is different than if you all say out and about. And I, there's very little I can do about that. But those of you that hear it and have met Canadians before will be like, ah, Canadian. Okay. But that accent didn't uh, interfere with my ability to talk to you and your ability to understand me. So can we create accents for AI in which um, they sound different than us? And that sounds strange, but actually there's already work where there's uh, water, there, this is called watermarking, where you can have AI produce statistically non-normal um, production of words. So if we know that humans in a certain context produce first person singular I at a rate of 6.7%, you could have AI only do it at one or two and with a whole bunch of things. So you can detect it with machine learning, but ideally what we want is that people can say, ah, you're AI, I, you have an AI accent. So how that gets regulated, what policies get in place, whether that has anything to do with bad actors that are trying to get around it. You know, there's all these sort of core issues. If you're, so that's a question about, you know, at, at, at a policy level. If you're a corporation, I think there's really important things that can be done. I'm working on a, a set of first principles for this. For example, if you're a company, one first principle could be if you, a consumer, ever interact with AI on, as part of our product, we will disclose it somehow. And so this might not be an accent, it might be in the same way that when you know, we first started using Google, the links were blue and you knew when it was blue you could click on it, AI language will be blue or something, right? So I think corporations have a, a chance here who are gonna be the first adopters to come up with some principles that will enhance trust in them as an institution for their clients. So I think there's lots of options on the table. Again, short term, no idea how that's gonna work out, but longer term, I think we just will adapt and figure it out. Marisha. Looking forward to the research on the D Dutch AI accent. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure that we'll have to wait a little. No, um, I'm gonna get out of my comfort zone and see whether this type of um, language can actually level the playing field. For example, for like shy people, because it strikes me that in specific contexts like dating apps, but maybe also in politics, communications and being like snarky and uh, you know pointy and and um, uh, well successful at bringing across your message has become so much more important than it was, let's say, 50 years ago. And so, would for example, trust in this message improve if you are yourself an incredibly shy person and you feel aided by the AI to sort of you know open up or fill in with some more color uh, the person who you want to present on this app. Right, yeah, no, absolutely. There's, there's huge communication positive potential here. Uh, so people with any kind of communication issue, whether it's just being shy to some sort of disorder, to being ESL. Like, I've talked to a lot of professors that are ESL, and they're like, this, oh, sorry, English second language, yeah. All right. <laughs> You're ESL. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, oh my God, like, I feel so more confident in writing now, right? I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to pay an editor. It's like game, like really in a deep way, right? 
Uh, there's a mental health crisis with adolescents right now. Uh, it's really, really bad. Those folks are, are moving into the workforce. There's already limits on human uh, counseling and human coaching. AI could play a huge role in dealing with this crisis. Um, we had, uh, as an example of a positive, we had a, a, an intern work in our lab in the social media, Elise, worked with Sunny Liu, who's the associate director of the social media lab, and we created pro-vaccine messages with using GPT-3. Again, an intern, undergraduate intern in three months, produced 10 really good ones with GPT-3, and we compared them to the CDC's 10 that it was giving governments pro-vaccination. So this gold standard, like these are the best in the world. The GPT-3 ones uh, outperformed the CDC, especially for conservatives. And when we looked into it, it was because it wrote in a little bit more casual style, CDC a bit more comfortable. But again, in three months, an undergrad intern beat, with AI's help, the CDC. Now, when we told people this was written by AI, they hated it, right? So it is, it's still complicated. But to me, it's like there is real potential, real power here that I am genuinely excited for. I really am. Like, I'm so excited for what young people are going to do. I think there's a creativity explosion about to happen. But all that potential will be undermined if our core sort of trust in one another is, is undermined. So really interesting, Jeff. Um, have you done any of these tests with AI experts? Oh, uh, getting them to try and judge? Uh, we have not, and that's a great idea, and they will fail. <laughs> You're sure about that? I'm, I'm really sure, actually, yeah. But let's put it to the test. Can we talk afterwards? <laughs> did you guess right? And are you an I AI I did expert? guess right. Okay, good. Um, and I think the or heuristic I applied is one that would be more likely to be applied by somebody who knows how these systems work. And do you think you'd be able to beat an optimized one? So I don't know about that, but I'm, I'm just, you know, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. We haven't and we should. Yeah. I'll go over here. As, as the mic is moving, well, here, you got, I'll, I'll ask afterwards, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you think this is going to put different industries who have different trust needs in order to function at disadvantages because they might have to make different choices about how much AI they integrate. Um, for example, I, I don't know if this holds with research, but instinctively, I don't have a reason to put a lot of trust in advertising. I know there's motivations there. So yeah. I wonder if the ad industry faces less trust downside in taking yeah. advantage of technology like this than, say, the federal government, who's yeah. having a trust crisis and doesn't right. want to see it worse. And if that's the case, are we then kind of putting industries in an unfair arms race where some can take advantage of technologies that others can't? Yeah, uh, it's such a great question. I think your intuitions are right. There's definitely domains in which people seem like, yeah, AI can work there, that, seem, that seems fine. And other domains where people really like almost repulse, right? So if, if I had to apologize to Nate and he found out that I used AI, he might be like, what the, like that's terrible. No, I'm angry. <laughs> You could also imagine a future where Nate's like, oh, man, like, good. You, you actually went to work using AI to craft that. I appreciate that. Right? So, like, there's ways in which we could think about that. Nate never has to apologize to me. Um, <laughs> Whether I use AI or not, I'll certainly fumble on, on, on it. <laughs> but your point about industry is an interesting one. So AI is – advertising is all in already. I mean, I was telling my, my, my students in the SML that we're going on to, into, you know, marketing and branding that – you know, within like two years ago, I was telling them if they weren't using this stuff, they're already behind the ball. It's because it's lightweight. Uh, AI is really good at generating uh, messages that can be targeted at different uh, demographics, different audiences. So we did. We were thinking the same with pro vaccination. You want to write one that's going to work in a rural conservative town versus, say, an urban uh, population. Those are really different messages. AI, no problem. Happy to do it. In fact, it wrote me a a country song for one and a hip hop song for another. So there's some stereotyping going on, right? But it did it like in seconds, whereas I would have to pay a marketing firm. Okay, if you're the pharma industry, right? You are suffering from a serious trust crisis. Even your own employees are not feeling good. They don't like saying that they're in pharma. And then you find out that, it, that pharma is using AI to communicate with patients. Oh my God, there would be just a huge collapse in trust. So I think you're right. I worry more about the inequality uh, we did a study asking people different kinds of AI. We didn't use the word AI that they interact with, like Siri and Alexa. 
there's huge differences. Like if you have a lower level education, if you have lower SCS, like uh, income and stuff like that, the likelihood that you've interacted with those systems is way lower uh, as you go down that. So what I, instead of industries, I'm like, whoever has more money is gonna get better AI and they're gonna be more persuasive, convincing, trusted, you know, and that's where I worry about uh, inequality taking place. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, we're all kind of here assuming that this is essentially a bad thing. Um, but I'm thinking, is it necessarily a bad thing that trusts the way we're using it today might end? Mm -hmm. Like, at least in, in cybersecurity, technical now, they're moving to this model of zero trust. Mm -hmm. We're just kind of rebuilding the architecture in a way that you always have to authenticate and prove who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think we've already almost reached a point where you really shouldn't trust anything on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so if you move to a model where you just assume everything is automatically generated, possibly a scam, probably fraud, you don't believe any emails or anything you read unless like the onus is on the communicator to authenticate and prove who they are. Wouldn't that perhaps be a good thing in the long term? Yeah, so I love that and I, I think I'm completely in agreement with you in the longer term. I think there's this paradoxical effect of these technologies that will make this face-to-face -face setting incredibly valuable, right? Like this will be the place where real conversations happen. Um, I see real positive outcomes on that. In the short term, here's the problem with that. Most of the information that people encounter online, according to a recent study by Ryan Moore and Nature Human Behavior, is not misinformation. Right? Most of the stuff that we encounter is either not factual, it's entertainment, it's opinion, and there's news. And so here's the problem, that we're, and we're working on this right now, is if you take that, what, would you, what did you call it, zero trust? N zero trust, sorry. If you take zero, zero would have been so much cooler, but zero it makes more sense. So a zero trust <laughs> approach to everything is uh, you're going to get really good at not trusting fake news, to just use the term real quick. That's good. You'll, get, you'll go to 100% at not trusting it, uh, at being accurate at saying that's fake, because you're not going to trust it. But then the majority of your, your media diet online, and, you know, if we believe um, Jennifer Allen and, and Duncan Watts, 98% of it is not fake news. And so now you're going to not trust the majority of the content you engage with, so that means that you are now not trusting trusted stuff. So now you are undermining people's ability to be accurately say what is real. And so in the short term, that's hugely problematic. In fact, I think I've played a role in like, we talk about misinformation as researchers that gets carried to the public. The public now believes that misinformation is everywhere. And it really isn't. So in my class, we do this thing where they look through the last 100 posts in whatever social media feed they use most, and we identify how much is there. And it's usually like maybe one person out of 100 has one thing in there. And so that's what zero trust could do, is undermine your faith in reality. Yeah, I was, I was just sort of, my question was building along that at the point where um, seeing is believing becomes completely invalid due to the yeah. confluence of deep fakes and everything else, maybe right. five years, maybe a little more from now, do we move toward sort of a new tribalism as also trust in institutions like government may collapse if you literally can't believe that anything is real? Will we only find mates when we meet in person? And, right, right. And et cetera. Yeah, I mean... That, that's, my, that's, the, that's my worry, um, and I don't know how bad it's going to get. Uh, you, you, you know, I, I, th by the end of this term, I will have one of my lectures done by guest lecture AI Jeff, right? So I've got my, my voice is pretty much done, still working on my video. Uh, and so, yeah, what will this election in 2024 look like? Um, we were really worried about deep fakes in 2020. I attended so many workshops and conferences and convenings, and it just wasn't a problem, right? Um, so the question I think is, do we, can we develop institutional ability to deal with deep fake-like things for consequential events like elections 
faster than the technology um, develops itself. I, I have some optimism. There's Hani Farid over at Berkeley is leading a consortium of watermarking with all the major media companies. So it's not like we're just sitting there and this is happening to us. We are reacting. It's, it's, it's a bit of an arms race on in, in the short term. Long term, I think it's net positive. Can I just ask, on the watermarking or, or, or even labeling, given that they're, the way that people are using AI is not different than the way you've done it in this study, which is they kind of iterate, right? Right. right. It, it's not, we've got some questions online that said that it's not between trust, full trust and zero trust, and it's not between human versus computer. There's all these intermediate stages there, right? And yeah. so, especially as we, as we get into, um, like on the watermarking side, I can, you know, my, my students, I'm sure, will they'll have the first draft written by yeah. G GPT, and then they will uh, end up editing it, yeah. right? And yeah. and then, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a, sort of like how, what is human, right? And what is machine at this point, right? That's right. No, I, I mean, I use it all the time. I, I think it's a great co-pilot. Um, and when we when we've analyzed people interacting with these systems, they almost always edit things. Right. And so they are. And 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 I don't know. Others have had this experience, but you're like, man, that's actually really good. I'm just going to do this editing. I, I was working with a, a student, Angela Lee. We we're working on it. And I was like, is this the last paper that I write? <laughs> you know, like are, in a year, two, three, when the systems are good enough, like why would I spend like I, I'm a, I think I'm a good writer, but I'm a slow writer. Why would I dedicate three weeks to writing the intro to a paper when when the system can do it. And then why would I read them? Because I know that AI just wrote it. And I'll just get AI to synthesize it down to the three key points, because I'm busy. So then it's all just like this made up, academia becomes like a made up thing if we continue with papers the way they are. Now, I said this to my students, PhD students, and they're like, no, it's not the way it's gonna be. And I trust their instincts more, because they're younger, they're using it. They're thinking of this co-pilot way too. It improves my R code. It allows me to think about, I got blocked, I gotta get to the next paragraph. But I don't know. I, I, I'm glad I'm a full professor with tenure. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, great time to end this. Thank you so much, Jeff. This is right. wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next week, we'll be joined by Michael Bernstein um, in the computer science department. He'll be um, uh, talking about, I think, some of the work related to AI and, and, and algorithms and, and yep. democracy. I should say that Michael, Jeff, and I, and, and, and uh, Gene Tsai, and, and um, Angel Christian, and, and Tatsu, uh, Tatsu Hiramoto, we're all part of this group looking at uh, democracy and algorithms here. And so uh, there's a lot of work that we're trying to do uh, on that. Uh, so uh, join us again next week. In join here. us in this, in this room this larger room than what we normally are in, um, or join us online. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.